Hi everybody, I'm Mark Chafferdini with Go See Talk. I'm here with Rob Minkoff, the director of Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Rob, thank you so much for coming to Dallas. I want to say that uh, I have deep regard for this movie. <laughs> uh, I loved it and I, I lost count of the times I laughed out loud. Um, so, Talking Rabbit, Talking Jungle Cat, Talking Mouse. Was a talking dog like the next evolution in your process, like an obvious step? If it's an animal, it has to talk. Okay. That, that's just my uh, motto. Okay, great. Well, you're a fan of the show, right? So that was one of the drawing. You know, uh, of course, absolutely. Yeah, when I was a, a kid, I remember watching Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Um, you know, it was actually on the, in, in its original run when I was born. So, uh, so if I reach back as far back as I can possibly remember, I remember seeing them. It's a DreamWorks picture, and they're known for their all CG movies. You know, great environments and stuff. A lot of movies, when they go back to an older property, they try to do it live action with a, a CG animal. Was that ever a choice, or was was making? Was yeah, actually, yes. Uh, the the company that was managing the rights is a company called Classic Media, and they were working with Tiffany Ward, who's Jay Ward's daughter, uh, and, and controlling all of the properties uh, that her father created. Um, and they, when we first had the conversation, I think they were under the impression that maybe it would be live action. And, and I was at the time I was working on Stuart Little, which was a live action movie with an animated mouse, um, but it. it it didn't take me very long to come around to the idea that doing it in animation would make a lot more sense. Hmm. Well, logistically for the story, you could do more in the environments, I would imagine, right? Not just doing more. It was really about the tone and sensibility of the storytelling because we were dealing with a talking dog that no one thought was strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the fact that people sort of accepted him uh, at face value and, and no one thought it was, was an odd thing that a dog would adopt a boy sort of sort of felt to me like that, that would be more whimsical in a sense doing it in, in animation. Well trying to bring old fans up to you know the, uh, along with the story and, and you know tell that adoptive narrative um, it is a beautiful montage in the beginning of set to the Beatles of uh, John Lennon's song Beautiful Boy. Talk to us about that like how that you know helped tell a lot of the story in a very concise manner. Sure well you know one of the things that we wanted to do was to sort of uh, travel backward in time with Mr. Peabody to kind of recollect uh, what it was like to be with Sherman over those many years because we were telling a story about the sort of evolution of these characters and, and their transformation uh, in terms of their relationship. Uh, obviously a very important story point is the fact that Mr. Peabody is taking Sherman to school for the first time uh, and sending him off into the world where he's going to meet uh, other characters and other people that are going to influence him and affect him and I think that moment is sort of a, a you know uh, an important moment in every parent's life because it's, it's something that all parents have to face uh, that's sort of you know sending your child out into the world uh, but we wanted to really understand better kind of what the nature and the tone of their relationship was leading up to that moment and so we decided to kind of journey back with Mr. Peabody through this sort of landscape of memories mm -hmm. uh, and, and seeing seeing these uh, various moments that they've shared together over time but the idea was that it was going to move backwards through history and backwards through their lives uh, because there was a great idea uh, just about the nature of time travel in that in a sense you know everyone we are all time travelers, uh, you know, and when you look at a sequence like that, obviously it brings that out. And the leads, Ty Burrell and Max Charles, they they really worked together very well. The chemistry was very palpable. Did they record their voices together at the same time, or was this? Uh, they they not often. I mean, they they did do they did work together. I think at least once, if not twice, uh, but mostly they worked uh, individually. Danny Elfman, wonderful composer, brings a lot of you know the tone to the story. But it's very non Danny Elfman music. What were some of the conversations you had? What were you going for? Well, you know, I think that was actually kind of an important thing. I, I, I because the film isn't, you know, we think of Danny Elfman, I think, as being dark. You know, that's sort of like the, mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the one descriptive I can think of that sort of fits with most of his work. Certainly, the work that he's done with Tim Burton. Um, but the film wasn't really dark. You know, the film was a little bit more brightly colored and 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 fun and and a comedy. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so. You know, it was important, you know, to have the music sort of reflect that. And, and you know, when he first started working, he did compose a variety of themes for the movie. Okay. Uh, and as we went through them, uh, there was something that was actually much more typical of Danny Elfman. And I kind of felt like that wasn't something that we necessarily wanted to do in the sense that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't trying to fit into the 
particularly that kind of canon of work, but but be something different. Now, as as a time travel action comedy, this has you know it's a nice subgenre all to its own, and it has, shares the likes of Back to the Future and Bill and Ted's. They look like there were some elements that were cherry picked from some seminal property. Well, sure. I think first of all, it's interesting and, and should be pointed out that Mr. Peabody and Sherman predates those things. You mm-hmm. know that the Wayback Machine was was maybe you know one of the first time traveling devices ever known to uh, uh, you know fiction. You know, maybe the H. D. Wells obviously uh, created the original time machine, but um, Back to the Future didn't exist. Bill and Ted didn't exist. And even Doctor Who didn't exist until mm-hmm. until after Mr. Peabody and Sherman. So they sort of they sort of got there first. But then when we looked at it and, and thought about what kind of a movie it would be, we certainly uh, thought about Back to the Future and Bill and Ted, um, and and tried a variety of different approaches to the storytelling. Obviously, the big difference between those two, and and I suppose you know, Bill and Ted shares more superficial similarities than. Back to the Future, in the sense that we go to a variety of historical places and meet a variety of historical figures. Sure. Whereas Back to the Future, they go to one place. You know, he goes back to his hometown in the in the era of his parents, and uh, you know, and explores that world and those characters for the body of the movie, and then only comes back at the very end. And we actually tried uh, uh, an approach that was very much like that with uh, with the Egyptian story with uh, with King Tut. We thought, well, this it actually could bear an entire feature like a film, mm-hmm. uh, which would have been entirely different and would not have allowed us to go to any other historical places. And I think there was a kind of a, a desire uh, amongst the creative people that it would be it would be somehow better to do, uh, to do a film in which we could go to a, a number of historical places. Now, Penny in the movie, she's the catalyst and maybe antagonist in a way that moves things forward. Um, talk about the challenges of making, you know, you don't see a lot of female antagonists that move the story forward. Talk about maybe her character. A sure. Bit. Well, actually, that was a very important element of the storytelling because uh, we had a, a script which the studio greenlit, uh, and Penny was not a character in that storytelling. In fact, Sherman's nemesis was a boy, uh, and uh, the writers of that particular script had to leave uh, because they sold the TV show to Nickelodeon, which they had to show run, and so we had to find another writer, and we met with a bunch of people, but finally with Craig Wright, who actually came up with the idea of Penny Peterson, uh, uh, kind of suggesting that maybe making the nemesis a girl would make better sense in terms of how it might affect Sherman and affect the relationship he had with his dad, mm-hmm. and how that would help us uncover some of the issues about the, the you know, that their unusual family. Uh, and so, right away, we knew it was a great idea, and hired Greg and uh, and started working with him on that, and started to kind of redevelop the story around that idea until finally the movie is entirely different from that script that got greenlit. So that if you read that script, you'd be shocked because you'd say, "Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with the movie that they made." Uh, but it was really that that you know that concept of Penny that really turned the whole thing around. I, I agree. It seemed like a great choice for her. Now the movie has a very frantic pace, but it, it slows down every now and then to have some really great dry humor, droll lines, and delivery. And Ty Burrell obviously brought a lot of that out. Favorite joke in the whole movie is the lunchbox. <laughs> the oh, the history of lunch. <laughs> Perfect sight gag. Talk about you know slowing down the pace and getting more of these you know, you know picturesque sight gags. Sure. Gosh. Well, you know, obviously when you're making a movie, particularly a feature length movie, you know you need a variety of, of of things to make it work. You know, and if it's comedy, obviously you need different kinds of comedy, whether it's verbal comedy, which we have quite a lot of. I'd say more than many films. It relies sort of on the verbal comedy of Mr. Peabody because he's so smart and so verbal. Um, but you know, you've got to have sight gags in a movie uh, ultimately. And, and a joke like, uh, the brief history of lunch obviously is, is probably the only kind of joke that you could get away with in, in a, you know, and Mr. Peabody is uh, the perfect place for that particular joke. Uh, you know, which, uh, which is, you know, pretty unusual. I'm glad you, I'm glad you noticed it. <laughs> it was too hard not to. Rob, thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.